This is a Spanish into English uh, translation lesson, and it's with a document from Peru. Um, I did change the names and the numbers and all the personally identifying information, of course, um, for privacy reasons. But other than that, it's an authentic document and is a realistic sample of the kind of work that translators um, get requests from people who are moving to the United States to study in a community college or a university, or maybe they're applying for work and they have credentials that they're trying to translate. We'd see a document like this in the packet. It's a one page source document. Um, the translation ends up being three pages with a certification statement on top and then a copy of the original. But um, this is the kind of order that I would expect to charge uh, $50 for. Um, and then if they wanted a notarized copy or a hard copy, then there might be an extra fee for that. But for most academic purposes, purposes a PDF of the translation would be fine and they could just submit that electronically in the application portal to the college they're studying at here. And so $50 is what I recommend for something like this. And then you'll see a range. Some people will do them for 25, some for 100. It kind of depends on who the translator is and whether it's going through an agency that um, upcharges for that. But um, feel free to ask questions at any point. I'm just going to get started, uh, share my screen. And give me a thumbs up if you can see the document now on the screen. Make sure I did that right. Yes, good. OK, so first, I have a bilingual certification statement. Where you see yellow, I would fill in the title of the document or description and my own name. You don't have to put it in both languages. If it's going to the US, then, then English is good enough. But I like to make it bilingual so that everybody involved can understand what this document is. Um, the translator's contact information can go here or it can go in the footer. That's where we usually put it at text and translation. And in this case, I'm going to delete the notarization statement. This is just our generic format, but um, no university that I'm aware of needs the translation to be notarized. Um, they do need it to be certified. You don't need to be a certified translator. You just have to be able to certify the accuracy of your own translation and give them somebody who they can um, follow up on if they want to verify that you are a legitimate professional translator and not just the guy who is submitting the transcript who translated himself. So if you haven't been in any of these um, episodes before, I'll just mention in the US, there is no official translation certificate that the government issues. Pretty much anybody can prepare a certified translation. And as a result, there's a wild uh, variety of quality in translations. And sometimes people will get a translation that gets rejected and then they'll come to us and say, look, this I, I, I paid somebody 20 bucks to do this and it got kicked back and I don't know why. And we'll look at it and help them to understand how to um, prepare a better translation next time. But that's the purpose of this, uh, this lesson is just uh, letting you know what sort of uh, the norms are that most universities are looking for in a translation. So I'm just going to I've translated in advance. It would take me more than an hour to do this from scratch, but I've printed up my um, English version here on the left that I'm looking at next to my screen, and I'm just going to type it and comment as I go. So in real life, it, it would take some research, like looking up names of courses and making sure I was coming up with the right phrasing for what that kind of course is usually called in a parallel program in the US, but I've already done that just to save time here. So first, I'll comment about the watermark in the center of the page. And I'll scroll down where you can see see how in the background there's this blue and red watermark. I want to comment about that. And you can do it down later in the page, but I like to do it at the beginning or else I'll forget. I'll say watermark in center of page. And then I'll type out what the watermark says. And then I'll mention that it has a logo after it. So it has a real big escutel. And so I like to use control and um, shift and left arrow to select that word or double click on the word SUTEL and then I use control right bracket to make it bigger since it's real big. You don't have to do that. It's just a stylistic decision there, a formatting decision. And then up here at the top, I see it has again the same logo. So I'll type it again, SUTEL. And then I'll type out um, what uh, my decision on what I'm going to call this uh, institute in English, higher education in telecommunications and telematics. And there are different ways you could render this. If I go to the website of the actual school and I see that they have an English page, I'll click on the English tab and then I'll see what they like to call their school in English. Um, in this case, as I recall, this was a while back, but as I recall, they didn't have a preferred English wording. And so I'll just come up with one. 
and it stands for Escuela Superior de Telecom Telecomunicaciones y Telemática. And so in Escuela Superior, you could say an institute, but it looks like it's part of, um, um, it looks like Instituto Tecnológico, no, ESUTEL, what does it stand for? Um, Instituto Tecnológico ESUTEL, I don't remember. Anyways, there's the Institute and then there's an Escuela Superior um, that is part of that. And so I'm trying to choose, I'm using the word Institute for one of them and higher education for Escuela Superior. Feel free to disagree with that. Um, that is a, a translator's judgment call, how you're going to rename it. Um, then in the middle, no, let me move this over a little bit. I see in the top right-hand corner, there's a series of logos and shields. And so I'm going to describe this one as a coat of arms. And then I'll type the actual name in Spanish, Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería. I don't use the accent marks even when I'm typing Spanish words on English translation. Um, if you want to fight about that, you can stay on afterwards and we can fight about whether that's defensible. <laughs> National University of Engineering. I do if I'm translating in Spanish. And so in square brackets, I'm going to put uh, my translation of what I think the name of that school should be. But I'm also leaving the original um, in case it's important for somebody who is researching this like a credentials evaluation service to be able to find that. And by the way, in the U.S., there, there are businesses called credentials, um, Foreign Credentials Evaluation Services, and they are a, sort of a related profession to translation, but they have different associations, different training, different uh, resources that they use. And they get something like this, and they write a report in English for the admissions office in the U.S. saying, this is most equivalent to an associate's degree, or this is most equivalent to a bachelor's degree. These courses are most equivalent to this. And they go into a lot more detail describing for the U.S. reader what the educational system in the source language country is like. But if you're hired just to do a translation, you don't have to dig in that deep. That's a more expensive and a more detailed service. And so sometimes somebody will come to me and say, hey, I need you to translate my transcript to get into a college. And I'll say, what college are you going to? I'm going to the University of Texas, Austin. And so the first time they asked me that, I got into the website for the school within the university they're applying to. And I saw on their admissions page that foreign transcripts have to be prepared by a foreign credentials evaluation service, not just a certified translator like me. And so then I go back to the client and I say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not allowed to prepare what you need. Here are some places you can go. There's a couple of companies in Austin that do that. And so I send them to somebody else because I don't want them paying me to make a translation. And then they submit it and it gets rejected. That, that wastes their time and money and then it results in arguments and nobody's happy. I'd rather send them to the right person. But if they're going to say Austin Community College where a lot of our clients are going to, then a certified translation with no foreign credentials evaluation is just fine. And I'm able to help with those. Next we have, and this is hard, hard for you to see on your screen, no doubt, but I can zoom in closer on the PDF. Um, there is a Latin motto, scientia, scientia et labor. I don't speak Latin, um, and I'm not a Latin translator, so I'm going to leave that in Latin. And if anybody cares, they can Google what that means. I could Google what it means, but I'm not qualified to say um, that I can certify the accuracy of this translation, so I'm going to leave it in Latin. They hired me to translate the Spanish. Uh, then we have the city, Lima, Peru. Are there any Peruvians here today? I, I asked a little while ago, but... We've had some join us since then. Um, if there are, get in the chat and please feel free to jump in and correct me when I say things that are not true about Peru. And welcome, by the way, Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería. It appears twice in the original, so I'm going to put it twice in the translation. I just translated it in square brackets right there, like one inch away, so I'm not going to waste space translating it again. Uh, Instituto Nacional de Investigación y Capacitación de Telecomunicaciones. And that's the first time that one's appeared, so I'm going to give my translation of it for the convenience of the admissions officer that only speaks English. National Institute of 
research and training in communication. Then, like always, Microsoft Word gets confused when you switch from one language to another, and it's not sure which spell check you want them to use. So I'll zoom back a little bit and look sort of holistically at this top section and make some adjustments so that it mm, looks more like the original, just so it's easier for people to figure out what I'm doing. And then I'm going to make all of this font smaller here um, because it's pretty small in the original and I don't want to take up too much space with that. This is just this is just prettying it up. Then I'm going to turn off some of the lines in the box. I'll turn off the top border and then I'll turn off, uh, let's see, the, the left border and the right border and the inside borders and it leaves just that line on the bottom and then it sort of corresponds to the original how there's that horizontal line if you don't like messing with formatting in word don't worry about it it won't get rejected because of the formatting it's just sort of a, a convenience and clients like it when they get it back and it looks something like the original it gives them confidence that um, it, you probably know what you're doing um, let's see and then I'm going to add insert row below down here. I'm going to put the name that's centered in the heading Instituto Tecnologico Esutel. I added an accent, but I don't want to take that out. Esutel. We wouldn't really use quotation marks in this context in U.S. English, but I'm going to leave it as the name of their school, Instituto Nacional. And I've already explained in the top left that stands for Higher Education, Telecommunication, and Telematics, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, and then I see that the full name of the school appears here, Escuela Superior de Telecomunicaciones y Telemática. Okay, I haven't already said that anywhere, so I'll type that out again. I was going to try to cut and paste just to save time. De telecomunicaciones y telemática. I have never heard the word telematics used in English until I started translating these, but it is a word in English, and there are telematics programs in the U.S., and so I'm going to keep with that um, verbiage. Okay, I'm going to turn this bottom border on and turn off the top border just for this cell. Top. You can quickly eat up a lot of time messing with borders. And if that's your thing, cool. Okay, whatever. Um, now we're going to get into the paragraph. And just for those of you, I always get somebody who gets on and complains, oh, you're putting personal information on the internet. So I changed it to Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra as the name of the student. And if anybody complains that I actually use Miguel de Cervantes' transcript for this exercise, then I have no words. <laughs> I should uh, eliminate misunderstandings. This report card, I'm going to capitalize like they did. This report card, Certificado de Notas, contains the courses. Let me zoom in a little bit in case this is small on your views contains the courses taken and grades received in the major for a carrera in Spanish. I like to use major in English of, and then I'll translate telematics engineering technologist. Now this is a, this again is controversial. How am I going to translate tecnológica de ingeniería telemática it, there is, I'm not aware of a degree in English called a technologist. Maybe certain schools give that, um, but I feel that a technologo um, or a tecnologica is probably well known in the Peruvian um, educational system. And it's probably a common uh, uh, program that you can study in. And so I'm going to use the kind of vague word technologist. Whenever you're going between two educational systems in two countries, um, and, you're, and there's no exact equivalent in the target language. You can use something that's sort of vague 
and then that uh, implies that this is a um, a credential that does not exactly exist and merits further description. Veterinary technologists exist here. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. It's good to know. So telematics engineering technologist. I can see that it's a three-year program, so I'm going to assume that it's somewhere between an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree in the US, but I'll just call it a technologist. Um, because if I say associate's degree in telematics engineering or bachelor's degree in telematics engineering, then I am adding too much information. I'm being too specific in the target language and I may be misleading the recipient of this translation. Telematics engineering technologist by Mr. slash Ms. Um, for el, la, señor, señora. Um, no sería la carrera tecnológica. I don't know what that means, Maria de Lourdes. Okay, moving on. Um, Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Um, in the studies taken at the Instituto Tecnológico Esutel during the period from June 1st, 2003 to July 16th, 2006. Notice I, I've been putting them in the traditional month, day, year order. That's most common in the US. For a total of six academic semesters with a total of 100 credits equal to 1,600 academic hours and an overall average of 15 points out of 20. So there, there are several uh, challenges here in the verbiage and trying to localize it to the U.S. market. Um, and one of them is... Uh, 1600 academic hours um, promedio general you could say a general average but overall average is the language used more in u.s uh, transcripts um let's spell that and then i would probably go back and i see that there are some underlined sections in the original but i'm pretty sure those are just being underlined by spell check like that's those aren't actual underlinings and so I'm not going to underline them in the translation, but I will bold these six academic semesters um, so it looks more like the original. And um, so 15 points out of 20. Good. You don't say 15 over 20 points. And now I'm going to read a comment here. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria de Lourdes. Eso es útil. And I also see that this paragraph is justified on both sides. So if you want to look just like that, um, you can select the paragraph and then click this button, um, justify, and then it'll spread it out so it's equal on both sides. Just a fine point, not important. Next, we'll go down here, hit Control E as a shortcut to center, um, and type curriculum for the telecommunications engineering major. Plan de Estudios is, curriculum isn't exactly the same that, it's more like the, uh, the course list or um, the course requirements. Um, I feel that curriculum is a synonym. De la carrera de ingeniería de telecomunicaciones. Okay. Question from the chat, could you split that intro paragraph into two sentences to make it easier to read? Yes, that's fine. It is a very long sentence. Um, I would probably split it right here after the date and say period. Um, this was a total of six academic semesters, so forth. No problem. I'm going to now look at this uh, grid, this table here, and figure out how many columns and how many rows I need. I see overall one, two, three, four, five, uh, six 
um, columns and the rows are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24, 26, 27, 28, 29. I think it's 29. I can always fix that later. But for now, I'm going to do a 6 by 29 um, table. And you go up here to insert table. Um, click on the insert table button for columns, put six, for rows, put 29, hit OK, and it'll pop out. If you don't like tables, you could do this with a text box. I don't recommend it because they have certain formatting limitations. And you could just ignore the box altogether and use tab to create this. But the advantage of using a box is it keeps everything lined up. It looks more like the original. It gives your recipient greater confidence that this is a, a translation of their document. And it also um, later on, if you get another one that's similar to it, it's easier to um, cut out the material from the old translation and paste it into the new one and um, not have to spend as much time on the formatting the second time around. So I would recommend you create a table. And before you even get started, uh, select the whole table and make the font a little bit smaller because it's going to be hard to cram all the stuff in here. So let's... Um, Select this first column. I see the first column is all left justified. So I'm going to left justify that at once. And then the second column, it looks like it's all centered. That's already set up for centering. A third column is all left justified. I'm going to left justify that at once. And then centered and centered. OK. So going across the top, I see that the uh, top border is turned off. I like that to match, just kind of as a personal stylistic decision. And then we have semester credits grade. A nota is a grade in almost all context in a US transcript of semester one. Got that. Uh, credits and grade. Um, and these can be moved over to leave more room for the course title. You just select the line and drag it over to the right, anywhere on this vertical divider. OK, we'll see if it fits. I'm going to use Math 1. A lot of you would probably prefer Mathematics 1, but um, I think Math is more common on US transcripts. Math 2. 4, 14. Mathematics isn't wrong. That's fine if you want to call it mathematics. Proyecto Integrador de Matemáticas. Um, this is uh, probably where uh, you're working on a, uh, a simulated project like you would do at your actual job, and it brings together a lot of different mathematical concepts. And the first time I translated this, I went to the course catalog and I read a description of the course. And you can do that for all of them. Could you do it in Excel and paste it back into Word? Sure. Yeah, I haven't tried that, but. Go for it. Um, so um, if you're unfamiliar with the courses, let's say your background is in accounting, and this is a biology transcript, and you've never taken a biology class, and you're, you're uncomfortable guessing what these courses are normally called in the US context, you could do a little research going back to the university website that issued it and the one that's receiving it and reading about um, the biology program and seeing what some of the names of the classes are. And that might help you to produce a better final project. But um, you're, you're charging by the page or you're charging by the word. And so um, there's a, a, a trade off in how much time you want to invest in research. Remember, you're not the credentials evaluator, you're just the translator. Proyecto Integrador de Matemáticas. I'm going to call this a math integration project. No, integrated, integrated math project. I like that better. Three credits, tab 15. And I'm using, I'm, I've got a full size keyboard here on a desktop computer, and I'm using the numeric keypad on the right. And once you get comfortable with that, that is a lot faster than going up to the top of your keyboard and hunting around. Three, 16, tab, 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 all the way across. Uh, classical physics. Notice that they um, have a lowercase c in the Clásica in Spanish, like typical Spanish title case. But when I'm doing title case in English, I'm going to capitalize each word except for uh, prepositions and pronouns, prepositions, and conjunctions, I think. Classical physics, tab 3, tab 12. 
um, nucleo general, a little bit of research led me to believe this is like the core subjects in a U.S. university. So I decided to call it general core two, two fifteen. Once in a while, the student will give you the course catalog with the description of each course and have you translate the entire paragraph, in which case the university, if they, if they need that, would get a better idea for what was covered in this class. General Core 2 is very vague in English. We have no idea what's being taught there, but that's what it says. Classical Physics, General Core Class 1. And I noticed some... On the right, we have Nucleo General 2, and on the left, we have Curso de Nucleo General 2, and the Curso de is apparently implied on the right, but they dropped it out in the Spanish, so I'm going to drop out the word class or course in the translation. 215 Algebra, Fundamentals. You could also say Fundamentals of Algebra, same thing. Um... Desarrollo de pensamiento crítico, critical thinking development. I like that. Um, 218, uh, humanities and engineering. That sounds like an interesting mix. Engineering 216. I started out as an engineering major and then ended up in humanities. And maybe that course would have changed my. Career path. English 1, uh, 215, programming fundamentals. You could say fundamentals of programming, that's fine. Uh, introduction to computacion. I'm going to use computer science. You could say computing, that'd be fine too. English 2. I'm going to stick with Roman numerals because those are common enough in U.S. course catalogs. If you want to use uh, the, the Arabic number two, that's fine. Total, I'll make it all caps like them. 18, 15.4. Depending on the country, they might use commas where we use um, periods for decimal numbers. And you want to change that into the period system. But in this case, it's the same. Okay, so I'm going to skip a line where there's a line skipped here and then start in with semester three. This looks like all the same stuff. So how about I just go up here and copy it using my Control C shortcut. Highlight that same place, Control V to paste it, and then I just have to change this to semester four. It's a little bit faster than retyping it all. And here we have math three. 315, probabilidad estadística, statistical probability, probability. If you see me make a typo, feel free to point it out. I won't be offended. I will appreciate it because typing in front of an audience is sort of like nerve-wracking. Discrete, and I often make mistakes here. Discrete math. Discrete math, in this case, I feel like discrete mathematics is the way that I've heard that course title before. And if, you, if you're not sure, like, let's say you didn't, you've never taken a class called that, just put in discrete mathematics in quotes and Google it and discrete math in quotes and then sort of scan down the first page of hits to make sure that these are university settings, the, the websites that are talking about it, and see which one is more common. And that'll give you a, a rough guess on how this um, course is or this discipline is usually described in English. Electrical, electrical circuits one, three fifteen. Um, chemistry three thirteen. Programming two three thirteen. And then we have this big space where there's a longer title. Uh, nucleo Operativo Uno. So I think this is in uh, contrast the Nucleo Operativo versus the Nucleo General. Um, rather than being general studies, now we're getting into operational studies, uh, practical applications maybe. And so I'm going to call this Operational Core 1. Programación Web. Web. Programming and network 
operating systems. If you've never come across a term, a phrase before, like Sistemas Operativos de Redes, uh, Google it uh, on different uh, terminology sites, like Word Reference might have this, uh, pros.com has a lot of good forums where people get on and talk about certain industry-specific uh, expressions and how it's commonly expressed in another country. Uh, Lingui is another resource. Just do your due diligence and don't go with the top hit um, site unseen. Read some comments and try back translating it on um, sources in the other language and confirming that this is a, a normal way to express uh, the name of the course or the name of the discipline. And here I see there's a, a typo in the original. It says Proyecto Integrador. Um, and there's a couple typos in this, actually, I think later on. And so I know that Integrador, they meant to say inter, Integrador. Proyecto Integrador. Does it have it right? Integrador. See here on the, on the third line, um, they spelled it Integrador. Here, Integrador. That's fine. Um, because this is not like a, a birth certificate, a government issued document um, that has to be officially corrected, I'm going to assume that um, the registrar who is typing this in just transposed two letters, and I'm not going to try to recreate the error in English. I mean, I could say integrative and then put sick in brackets to draw attention to the fact that there's a typo in the original, but just looking at the big picture, the purpose of this translation, the sending culture, the target culture, the needs of the client, I'm going to assume, I'm going to correct in my head um, the spelling of, of integrative and call this integrative and comprehensive project. Cabelado estructurado, structured cabling. I imagine that's running cables inside a machine to correct, to connect to sensors. Programming 212 digital system. So I'd like to, to point out that I've never studied a lot of these classes and I'm not familiar with this major. I, I've taken some engineering classes and I've worked on a lot of engineers uh, transcripts but there are certain engineering related jobs that I would pass on because they're too technical for me. Like let's say this person is now um, submitting a patent application on some really uh, original piece of technology and describing it in terms that, that just don't make sense to me. If I got a request to translate something like that, so I would look at it and say, you know, this should really go to an engineer who is also a translator who's familiar with the concepts behind this. Um, I'm going to, to pass on this because I can't do it justice. Digital systems 215. And the longer you spend in the career field, the more of a feel you have for what your personal limits are. And also the more people you, you meet, more colleagues who are good uh, uh, recipients of referrals or who will refer things back to you. Communications and research. Investigación, you can say investigation in English, but in academic system, you don't investigate things, you research them. In a law enforcement setting, you investigate them. And here, communication is singular in Spanish. Um, I feel like communication and research, communications and research are interchangeable in English. I'm gonna leave it on the plural. That's not wrong. Okay, skipping this one down to English three. 217. Oh, no, I missed one. Let me go back there. Sistemas operativos, operating systems. It might be operational systems, but I believe in the technological context, we call that an operating system 215. Uh, total 19.14.5. Sixteen, fourteen point eight. It's easy to make mistakes with rows of numbers because they're kind of abstract, and your your eye can just skip to the wrong line. So um, when I finish this, I'll go back and put a finger on the source and a finger on the target, and just go through and double check that I got all the numbers right and that I didn't skip any lines or skip any classes. So here I see we have this same horizontal row repeated. So I'll select it with my mouse. And go down here, and I'm probably just selecting the first putting mouse at the beginning will be enough. I don't have to select all the way across. 
So I'll go in and change the semester Roman numerals to five and six. And then we have math four, three, fourteen, database. Uh, base de datos, singular, okay, I'll leave that in singular in English. And then I see Nucleo Operativo again, and so I can't remember what I called it in the first time it appeared, so I'll scan back up. I want to be consistent. Operational Core, uh, Nucleo Operativo. So I use that same verbiage down here. Operational Core 2. Electro mag and here we have another typo in the original mas masgentismo instead of magnetismo. It's safe to assume that's an honest mistake, and we don't need to try to draw attention to it in the translation by using the sick note. Electromagnetism and numeric methods or numerical methods. Numeric and numerical are both fairly synonymous adjectives in English. Um, numeric methods, numerical methods. I like numerical, and if you disagree, feel free to get in the chat and tell me what the difference is. If you're a mathematician, probably for mathematicians, there's a slight difference between numeric and numerical. Information. Informatica is usually information technology in English. Information technology. And seguridad is usually security in this context versus safety in other contexts. Information technology, security, um, security of information technology, I'm not sure which is the most um, uh, idiomatic. Um, here we have software, spelled S-O-F-W-A-R-E. I think that's a typo, but I know what they mean. Uh, software engineering 315. Microondas y satélites, microwaves and satellites 215 telematics and telematics systems 316 protocols 217 the cool thing about translating a, a, a technological document like this is that a lot of the terms are international. Things like sistemas, uh, satellites, um, electromagnetismo, um, a lot of those cognates that sound the same in English and Spanish are actually the same term that's used. But it's easy to uh, take that too far and assume something's a cognate when it really has a, a totally different root in the other language. 215. Uh, network design. For diseño de redes, 213. Telematics. Electrical. Like make sure you get electrical and electronico separate. Electrical circuits, 2. 215. Telematics systems. Telematic. Telematics. Telematics systems. I'm not sure. I'm going to leave that in the plural. 215. Distributed systems to 14, total 16, 14.8, total 14, 15.1. Now, if we have time, I'll go back and put some of those in bold so they correspond to the bold in the source document. Software is an adapted loan word in Spanish. Okay, so maybe, maybe the spelling without the T is how it's uh, normally used. In Spanish, it's, at least in this context, that's perfectly reasonable. Authorized by Dirección Académica ESUTEL. I'm going to call that the ESUTEL uh, Academic Office. Now, the Dirección implies that it's the office of the director. If you want to be more specific, you could put the director's office. But I think in this context, uh, U.S. University probably is called that the Academic Office or maybe the um, Office of the Director, Office of the Dean, and because the systems are organized differently, it's hard to get, it's hard to be both concise and accurate. You have to do one or the other. All right, thank you, Jess. It's helpful. Um, Consejo Directivo is probably the Executive Board. Inictel Uni Executive Board. Executive Board. Um, if 
I believe I have explained what INICTEO stands for, Instituto Nacional de INICTEL. It's probably this one up here, Instituto Nacional INICTEL. So if you want to, you can go back and copy and paste um, this uh, English rendering in square brackets of what INICTEL stands for. I've already mentioned it on the same page, so I'm not going to bother to do that again. Then I hit Control R to get all the way to the far right and include the city here, San Borja. No, I think that would better be placed with the description of these three seals at the bottom. So I see three seals going across. And in order to make the formatting a little bit faster, I'm going to insert a three wide table here. And each one has a circular seal. So I'm going to type that once and then hit shift home to select the whole thing. Hit sh um, control, uh, control home, shift home, yeah. And then control C to, uh, and control V to paste it across. If you like shortcuts, that'll be a little bit faster. If you don't, never mind. Now on your, on the, the paste uh, JPEG image here in the translations, it's hard to read, but I, went through and zoomed in on the PDF of the scan of the original that I was working from originally and see the names of these schools. And so I'm able to recreate them. Nacional de Investigación y Capacitación de Telecomunicaciones. National Institute of Research. And training capacitation is, is a poor calc of capacitación into English use training. In telecommunication, I think that's how you spell it. Um, UNI National University. You don't have to put it in both English and Spanish. I feel like because the original is attached and the recipient can scan up to see what it's called in Spanish, if you want to just put it in English, translate the name of the organization and put that in your translation at the bottom, that's perfectly fine. It would not get rejected for that. But a lot of translators feel like it's important just as a, as a general principle to keep proper names of people and proper names of organizations and entities the same in both languages if the same alphabet is shared, if it's coming from Cyrillic or Japanese or Korean or some other alphabet, then of course you would at least transliterate it into the Roman alphabet for use in the United States. Instituto Nacional de Investigación. Y, oh, here we have the same thing again, so I should have cut and pasted it. Capacitación de Telecomunicaciones. Unictel, Unictel, Uni, and then Executive Board. In the original, it says uh, no director ejecutivo. Oh, in the stamp, it says dirección ejecutivo. Um, so I'll put Executive Board, um, Executive Office for dirección ejecutivo. I like that better. And then there is a signature which has been blurred out for privacy purposes. And then it says director ejecutivo. So that's executive, executive director. And then it says again, initel, initel dash uni. And then finally, we have San Borja, the name of the city, uh, the rubber stamp, which says Esutel and if you want to spell that out, that's Telecommunications and Telematics Institute. I've already explained that elsewhere. And part of it is illegible um, because of, and you can't see this in this copy, but it was, um, there's writing on top of a rubber stamp. And so I'm just going to mention that some illegible text there. And then get down here, center, and put in the signature. Remember, you don't have to figure out what the signature says. You just have to mention the signature and refer the reader back up to the image of the original director of ESUTEL or ESUTEL director. And if you want, you can explain what ESUTEL stands for, but we've already done that. So I've gotten to the end of these three signatures. There's a horizontal line there, 
And so I think I will turn off the uh, top and the left border and the right border and the um, inside borders and just leave that horizontal line at the bottom so it looks like the original control L to get over to the left. Here you have an address. I like to leave the address in the original language, but mention, by the way, this is an address just so people don't wonder, why did he leave this part in Spanish down here? So I'll type it out, Avenida San Luis, 1771. They have a little um, hyphen here, which is odd, but I'll keep it. I'll keep that formatting the same. Apparently that's normal in Peru. Never been to Peru, I'm sorry to say, but I hope to someday. Looks like a lovely place. Web page or website. I think website would be a more typical idiomatic choice here. Es hotel edu pay. Of course, you leave the website the same. You don't translate anything in there. And if it Word likes to add a hyperlink when it sees a, a URL, um, but then it changes colors and it adds an underline that isn't in the original. So I'm going to hit Control Z to take out that automatic hyperlink. For telefono, please use phone and not telephone. That's just a pet peeve. You can put telephone if you want. Neither is wrong. They're synonyms. And it looks like that completes the translation. So I'm going to go back to view, remove split, and then back out and look at the document as a whole and say, does the translation follow the original enough in formatting that it's easy to go back and forth between the two? and find stuff, and I think yes it does. Now I want to make it a little prettier, and so I'm going to add some bolds here in the table where it's bolded in the original. Don't go overboard on making your translation pretty because nobody's paying you to do that. It's just, it's nice. Some people appreciate that. And it looks like maybe this is bolded down here in the footer. Okay, and three pages. Okay, so at this point, if this were a real job and not just a demo, I would go back through and follow along with my fingers on the source and the target. Probably put it left and right on the screen here rather than top and bottom because I've got a nice wide landscape format monitor. Go through and proofread it all myself and then um, give it to my proofreader. Everything should be proofread before you give it to the client because we all make mistakes and you want to make mistakes in-house and not um, with somebody who's paying you. And much worse, um, you don't want the mistake to be caught by the university that it's submitted to and rejected. Then it's more trouble for everybody and it's embarrassing. And so um, please, uh, even if you're uh, an experienced translator for many years, um, find somebody who will proofread your translations, a colleague, somebody who can pay a a small feature, like maybe a fourth the price of the original translation or a fifth the price. You can work out a per word rate, a per hour rate, or a per page rate, or just find a friend or family member who's willing to do it um, to support you in your career endeavors. Um, but it should never go out to the client until you've proofread it and the second person to proofread it. Also, if Spanish is your native language and you're translating into English, it's likely that it sounds kind of like translation ease, meaning it's too close in syntax to the Spanish original and it sounds sort of foreign in English and it might be confusing for somebody who only speaks English. And so it'd be good to have the proofreader be somebody whose first language is English, who's English dominant, who would go over and just smooth it out and make it sound more natural. And that's why I don't translate into Spanish. I translate from Spanish so because I know what sounds natural in English. And I'm checking the chat here, phonetic adaptation, Mark, are you explaining? Electrico, electronico. Um, yes, uh, I'm just saying um, that it's easy to confuse the words electrico and electronico in English or Spanish. And so whenever I see one of those, I just tell myself to make sure that I'm talking about an electrical system versus an electronic system. And in engineering, I think it has to do with um, if it, uh, you know, like the, the lights, turning on the lights for this room is a fairly simple circuit. Um, it's, a, it's a switch that I manipulate manually. This is an electrical system, but if there were a microchip with a timer inside the switch controlling it and turning it on and off at certain times, and it used uh, an integrated circuit design, that would be ele electronic. And so electronic is just has to do with a smaller scale and more complex design than electric. Electronic is a form of electrical system 
but not all electrical systems are electronics. It's a subset. And so fortunately in English, the, um, the two words have, have clear parallels, clear cognates. So we have a few minutes left. Um, this will go up in my blog uh, next week. Uh, and the um, uh, translation, the, this translation here, you'll be able to download it. And the YouTube video will also be posted if you want to get back to it and use it for training. If any of you are instructors and you want to use these materials in your own training courses, you're welcome to do that. This is not copyrighted. Um, Alejandra, I'm going to read more about it. OK, good. Thank you. Yeah, every time I do a, tra uh, uh, a translation of a transcript, I learn more about a, a different department in the university that I didn't actually take any classes in. But I I'm, I'm welcome other questions right now. I'm going to stop sharing. And if you want to speak out loud, I might have to unmute you. I think I accidentally muted everybody here from the get go, but you can tell me in chat. I want to be unmuted or you can just put your questions there in the chat. Um, big, big picture uh, points that I want to leave you with are um, if you are translating into your second language, be especially careful about um, researching and making sure that the phrasing you're using is idiomatic and natural and common in the receiving country where the translation will be used and make especially sure that your your proofreader also is fluent um, in the target language um, ways that these will get rejected um, clients who whose translations have been kicked back from universities are if they translate their own document uh, they leave stuff out, like maybe they say, oh, these, these rubber stamps aren't important. And they just skip over the rubber stamps. They're like, those are on all of them. That's, that doesn't apply to me at all personally. And then the registrar gets in. They're like, what does this rubber stamp mean? For all I know, this says void or kicked out or expelled or cheated. So make sure all the rubber stamps and the fine print and the header and the footer and even handwriting is noted. If there's handwriting on there and it's just a scribble, like it might be a signature, if you're not sure. I'm just at least put a note in square brackets, say um, illegible handwriting or something or pen mark to draw attention to the fact that you you did notice it and that you um, indicated it in some way in the translation. A uh, question in the chat, Rector de la Universidad, how do you translate rector in English? There are universities, especially religious ones in the U.S. that use the term rector, um, but uh, I would and and if look at the signature blocks and if you can go across and see, oh, this is the person who is in charge of all um, academic and financial and um, administrative aspects, you might use superintendent, you might use dean, you might use president, you might use director. Um, it kind of depends on whether it's a small college, whether it's a large university, whether it's um, somebody who's over an entire university system, like the, the chancellor. Chancellor is a, a term that some universities will use or vice chancellor. So there are different, there are different terms. Uh, Guillermo, I wouldn't say that one of them is always the correct translation and the other is not. 